the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. The Anarchist Inquisition by Mark Bray. Hello, everyone. Today I'm talking about some of the themes in my new book, The Anarchist Inquisition. Um, Primarily, the book revolves around the relationship between what is frequently referred to as terrorism and human rights. I say frequently referred to because um, I believe that the term terrorism is really ultimately counterproductive because of the political connotations it carries in demonizing political violence uh, from below and normalizing it from above. Um, Instead, in the book, I talk about propaganda by the deed or the words for attack that were frequently used in Spain and France, like atentado or atenta. And I talk about the relationship between this political violence and what I argue ought to be considered human rights in the campaigns that were organized by anarchists and their allies at the turn of the 20th century in Western Europe and beyond to liberate their imprisoned comrades. So to take a step back, the basic dynamics that we look at in the book are, number one, anarchists throw bombs at generals, uh, they assassinate prime ministers in the late 19th century. Uh, I'm looking primarily at Spain and France. And in response, the French and Spanish states unleash increasingly more indiscriminate and brutal waves of oppression, not only against anarchists, but against the workers' movement in general. Uh, And then finally, I look at the transnational campaigns that were organized to liberate these imprisoned comrades in in Spain. And I, I argue that we ought to think about them within the history of human rights. So let's unpack some of those dynamics as we go along here. So propaganda by the deed. In the late 19th century, the anarchist movement, to a good extent, became um, fascinated with what they believed to be the revolutionary potential of setting a spark that could ignite popular rebellion through dynamite, through assassinating a, a key figure. Now, Historians have been right to clarify that it was really a very small minority of the anarchist movement that ever threw a bomb or even argued for this strategy uh, without reservation. On the one hand, you had the what you might call insurrectionary, more anarchist communist end of the political spectrum that was very critical of formal organization beyond an affinity group of, of, say, a dozen people. And on the other end, you had the vehemently anti-dynamite and usually anarchist collectivist wing of the movement that was usually focused on labor organizing. But what I think some historians have left out is that there was a really broad gray area in between of anarchists and working class people that were... Um, sympathetic to some acts of propaganda by the deed, at least in private, depending on the context and the target, whether there were um, bystanders who were injured, whether the target was was a quality target and not seemingly random people, and so forth and so on. We can see the range of perspectives in response to some of the more prominent bombings in Spain in the early 1890s. So, for example, Paulino Payas throws a bomb at General Martinez Campos on the Gran Via in Barcelona in 1893. Um, Part of what's notable about this bombing is that although um, dozens of bombs had been set off in Barcelona over the previous decade, Paulino Payas was the first anarchist to actually be arrested for throwing a bomb in Barcelona, um, in large part because he gave himself up. After he threw the bomb, he stood out in the middle of the chaos, threw his cap up in the air and said, Viva la Anarquia. And so he, he, he was arrested, and this was an example of a bombing that got a lot of popular support, it seems. So um, lithographic portraits of Payas were printed and sold in kiosks on the Rambla to such a great extent that authorities went around confiscating them. 
um, when he was eventually executed and buried, uh, eventually the, the guards had to be stationed at his grave because there were so many visitors that authorities were worried that they would disinter his, his body. Um, uh, on the other end, um, for example, uh, not long after his comrade Santiago Salvador to avenge him threw two bombs into the Liceo Opera House in Barcelona, targeting what he considered to be a bourgeois crowd. Um, that bombing seems to have been less popular, right? Um, certainly more indiscriminate. So if you fast forward to um, 1896, 1896 represents a kind of turning point in the story. Prior to 1896, bombs that were set off in France and Spain um, elicited repression. Um, the, both, both states tortured anarchists, uh, executed them. But outside of anarchist circles, there wasn't much of an outcry. This changed in 1896. That year, a bomb was thrown into a religious procession outside a church in Barcelona. Uh, initially, some anarchists argued that it must have been the work of a kind of police agent provocateur because the bomb exploded at the rear where the everyday people were marching, not at the front where the important people were marching. Um, in, in retrospect, it seems quite possible that the that it, it was an anarchist who set off the bomb but simply made a mistake in, in when it exploded. In response to the bombing, um, the Spanish state arrested somewhere between 400 and 800 people, not only anarchists, but different kinds of Republicans and socialists and unionists and um, Freemasons, uh, secular people and so forth. Um, before long, um, some of the anarchists were tortured in Montjuic Castle overlooking Barcelona. These anarchists managed to get word of their plight out by writing letters to the press and sewing them into the lining of, a, of the jacket of one of their comrades who was ill and therefore got sent to an infirmary outside of the prison, and he could then pass the letters on to the press. And so what, what changes this time is that largely through connections in France, um, with the help of Charles Malato and um, some other anarchist comrades there, they managed to trigger a really unprecedented transnational campaign against what they called the revival of the Inquisition in Spain. And, and this campaign spread across Europe, North Africa, and the Americas and beyond. And I argue made a, a really interesting argument, which may sound somewhat anachronistic for some from our present day point of, of departure, but really wasn't all that unusual for the era, which is that uh, torture and repression in Spain was an attack on the rights of humanity. Uh, anarchists and others didn't argue in terms of the laws of the state of Spain, which they considered to be illegitimate. They argued that these um, abuses were an affront to humanity in general. And so I, I argue that uh, it, it's illuminating to think of human rights campaigns at the turn of the 20th century, not only this, but, but others, as I describe in my book, and I think that this anarchist argument for human rights, which really ran deeper than simply uh, making a strategic argument in the context of a campaign, but reflected the degree to which they spoke about rights in their writings at the time, um, and the degree to which some anarchists like Juan Monsain, uh Anselmo Lorenzo argued that anarchists were the true inheritors of the individualism of classical liberalism. And as opposed to the liberals of their era, who let that individualism be trampled upon by the state, anarchists, they argued, were the ones who actually lived up to the promises of liberalism and to this notion of natural universal rights. And in that sense, I argue that we can think of these anarchist human rights campaigns as uh, examples not only of human rights beyond the state, but even against the state. And as an interesting alternative point of departure for thinking about the tensions that exist between human rights and state sovereignty that scholars have been thinking through for, for decades. And so what ends up happening is this campaign is ultimately successful. But what's interesting is that part of the reason why it's successful and part of the reason why subsequent campaigns are successful, I argue, is paradoxically because of the role of propaganda by the deed. So 
1897, the Italian anarchist Michel Angiolo uh, assassinates Prime Minister Canovas del Castillo while he's on vacation in a spa in the Basque Country. And this is, I think, arguably the most effective example of propaganda by the deed in this history because um, Canovas, the, the conservative prime minister, was the most intransigent um, defender of the war in Cuba at the time, which was resulting in hundreds of thousands of deaths through the policy of reconcentration um, orchestrated by the notoriously brutal General Weiler, uh, really an example of um, genocide and was also essentially the one who oversaw the repression of anarchists and their allies in Barcelona. When he was uh, assassinated by Angiolio, um, his successor was a liberal prime minister who reversed courses in both ways, uh, ended the policy of reconcentration in Cuba, and released a bunch of the anarchist prisoners in Barcelona. Ultimately, um, all of the Montjuic prisoners in Barcelona were released, other than the ones, of course, who were who were executed. And over the next decade, Juan Monsain, um, his partner today, Manier, and a bunch of their allies orchestrated several more prisoner campaigns that, to one extent or another, use this argument about the rights of humanity and use the kind of template of resistance that they developed with the Montjuic campaign revolving around creating broad, seemingly apolitical coalitions of allies across the political spectrum um, through a campaign of um, press outrage that was grounded in arguments about how torture and um, state brutality were an affront to the advances of civilization using the language of the revival of the Inquisition. And, and these campaigns over the next decade um, several of them were to liberate um, anarchist prisoners in Andalusia, and then they they put this to work in the two um, Francisco Ferrer campaigns when the Catalan anarchist pedagogue was um, first in, in 1906-1907 charged with allegedly being part of a plot to kill the king, and then 1909 it, he was charged with being the, the single mastermind behind the Tragic Week Rebellion. And what we see in these campaigns is that Spanish state officials were concerned that if they unleashed another wave of completely indiscriminate repression against the workers' movement, as they had done in 1896, that this would generate reprisals. Now, that's not to say that propaganda by the deity is an effective method uh, of struggle under most circumstances, certainly Anarchists wouldn't have found themselves in this problem to begin with if it weren't for these bombs. And as we see later in the decade, um, by 1906, 1907, there was a rethinking of the efficacy of this strategy by many anarchists who pushed for revolutionary syndicalism. And this leads to the creation of Solidaridad Obrera, the predecessor to um, the CNT. Uh, and certainly, it's, I think it's different to think about this role of this political violence when carried out by individuals or small groups versus, for example, in the 1920s in the context of um, simmering class war and part of a mass movement. Nevertheless, um, it is interesting to think about the kind of paradoxical relationship between the political violence of propaganda by the deed and these arguments for universal rights, particularly when there were some individuals within the anarchist movement who either we know or or we have very good reason to believe were involved in both sides of the coin, that is, throwing bombs and making claims about the rights of humanity. And, and this may seem like a kind of impossible overlap for many, but I think those of us who have researched anarchism understand that anarchist arguments for um, what were at the time frequently phrased in terms of the rights of humanity, the rights of all, many anarchists argued could only be accomplished by destroying the state, destroying capital, and fighting back against the agents of oppression. And in that sense, I think it's really one of many examples of how, despite the liberal notion that human rights imply uh, a kind of absence of violence, we can see uh, you know, through the storming of the Bastille, through the role of the development of the, light, the, the language of human rights during World War II, um, 
through examples of wars waged allegedly in the name of human rights that the relationship between political violence and human rights um, is not uh, necessarily antithetical. Um, so the anarchist inquisition delves into all these kinds of dynamics. It, um, it's really a narrative history that focuses on the lives and travails of, um, anarchists, whether bombers, campaigners, or otherwise, uh, their enemies and their allies at the turn of the 20th century in Spain and France. I hope you check it out and you enjoy later. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.